welcome to Broadcast. Welcome. I'm Dan Gormansky. That's right. I'm just James. I don't have a fun last name like you. So Dan, just why don't you quickly introduce yourself and, and what you think of the hobby and uh, you know what, what makes 1E such an appeal for you. So uh, I played back in the 1980s, first edition. I believe it was the, I don't believe I played original or basic to the best of my knowledge. If I did, it wasn't a lot. And I took about 29 years off, came back to the game about two years ago. And to be honest, part of the reason I, I wanted to play 1E was for the nostalgia. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that's a bad word. Right. Uh, and my view is if it's not broke, don't fix it. I love 1E. And so I really have no desire to play another edition. It doesn't mean that I don't think the other editions probably didn't make improvements. They probably did. But uh, I just, I want to play 1A. Simple yeah, as that. Exactly. Uh, I, I think I have a similar story. And we'll probably do on another podcast of how we got together and how to set up a group if you're like us who took 20, 30 years off from the hobby and then you want to get back into it and you're not ready to jump in with all the new games, you want to play the games that you remember. And again, thanks to Dan, uh, he started a group here in our area that uh, has allowed me to start playing again. I Same thing, I started playing in the 80s, kind of went into a uh, hiatus for about 25 years. And once I started having kids who were old enough to play, I started playing, that rekindled my interest. And uh, now we're kind of gung-ho, we're looking at the next steps, which is even hosting a convention uh, this year and doing a bunch of things, including this podcast. So today, uh, for those who are interested in 1E, one of the first things you're going to do as a player, assuming you're coming into this, is to create your own character. So, um, you know, Dan is has set up rules because his philosophy, and I'll let him expound it, uh, he, he wants to play as Gary Gygax envisioned it. Is that a fair statement? I think that's a fair statement. My understanding is that uh, Gary Gygax himself deviated from some of the rules, so <laughs> maybe I'm even a little bit more uh, 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 honing to the rules uh, than Gygax did. Uh, this is my thought on, on Raw, as they say it, right? Rules is written or, or by the book, is that I want to first play by the rules and then decide if a rule doesn't work, then maybe think about changing it, but I'm not a big fan of starting with discarding a rule from the outset because I think it's not going to work well. Uh, but so yeah, we're doing our best to play by the book, but I think we've already abandoned some rules. We'll talk about that, I assume, in other podcasts right. about rules that are commonly discarded. Yeah, I think you and I have a, a similar thing. I think you're, uh, you haven't been DMing as long as I have. Is that a fair statement? Oh, without quite. I've only been DMing since I started playing again, so only about a year and a half or so. So, um, you know, where I... Quickly after starting playing, I started DMing. And so then, um, you know, we also have this nostalgia of how we played and what we thought our, how we playing was. And, and I appreciate that you're like, well, I may have not played correctly back then. I want to do it right. And then unfortunately, the reality of, of not only the rules, but the conditions of the players that you have and what they're willing to either endure or accept as fun. I use the open quotes, first time open quotes that uh, what is fun and there's always that tension between what the dungeon master wants to get out of it and what the players do and again there's that one e vibe which i still think is preferable for my taste which is you know it's a it's yes it's a collaborative thing but the dm has to set the table and has to find some uh enjoyment of that uh, where it seems like in later editions that tended to move towards where the, as long as the players were happy the game was good so let's talk about character rolling what's your What's your questions or what's your thoughts on character development in 1E? Okay, so uh, character development in, in 1E, obviously it starts with rolling your ability scores, right? I think that sort of drives everything, right? I mean, I remember when I rolled up a character back in the day, the first thing I did really before thinking about what race, what class was roll the dice. Right. Because, and again, I don't know how other editions work, but in 1E, of course, you... If, for certain character classes, if you want to be them, you've got to make certain roles. And so certain character classes are going to be unusual. So, And I know that there's a litany of methods to roll your ability scores in 1E. You, you're you more ambitious than I am. You use more of these. I'm a, a what is it, the method, the four die six. Right. You, you roll four dice six times, right? You take the three highest of each roll, and then you put them in any attribute you want. 
I, my understanding is that's what Gygax used. That's not necessarily a reason why you should use it. Yeah. But I think that was pretty much the most, my recollection is that was the most popular method back in the day. That's the only one I've ever used. Right. And if you're coming from uh, newer iterations, whether it's, the, you know, again, we, the player's handbook, which has, and I'm showing it for their viewers, you know, this is the first edition and subsequent editions, you notice the progression moving away from the dice and the rolling dictate what your character is to you deciding what your class and character is and decide and doing that. So, you know, in the Dungeon Master's Guide, the first thing it talks about is the dice and probability, and then it goes right into how creating a player character. It doesn't talk about how, what kind of character you want to roll, what kind of envision of your, what your character is going to do. It talks about, here's the ways you roll the dice, and there's the you know, the four methods that are described in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And you know what I'll say about uh, rolling up characters is my recollection. I'm sure people have different experiences. I think I was fortunate enough that everyone I was played with, if you didn't make, if you really wanted to be a particular class that needed high scores and you didn't get the rolls, right. people were generally okay with that. They right. didn't complain a lot about it. You just accepted that that's, that's the one E-way. Not everyone's going to get to be the character class that they want. But, yeah. um, so can I... I'd like to roll. Can I roll? I, you know, because how long has this podcast been going on? And I haven't rolled any dice. And That's I'm right. really anxious. Yeah, that was one of the things we talked about, is we didn't want this to be 45 minutes of us jibber-jabbering and really get into the rolling. So I'm, there's four methods. Do you want me to describe the methods real quick, and then which one you're going to pick? Yeah. Oh, well, you know what I'm going to pick, but okay. go for it. So in the Dungeon Master's Guide on page 11... Uh, method one is all scores are recorded in the range in the order the player desires. 46 are rolled and the lowest die, die, or one of the lower is discarded. Method two is all scores are recorded in the range as in method one. 3d6 are rolled 12 times and the highest six. So the first way you roll 46, six times, you drop the lowest dice in each one and you can arrange them in order. The second one you roll 3d6, 12 times and you pick the top six. Then method three is... Scores rolled are according to each ability's category. And again, in first edition d and it's strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, charisma. No comeliness, no other stats. That's uh, not considered in our uh, uh, old school. And 3d6 are rolled six times in each ability, and the highest score in each category is retained. And then method four, 3d6 are rolled sufficient times to generate six ability scores in order for 12 characters. So basically you roll 12 times and you pick the... You pick the best uh, character. So, which uh, method are you going to use? Can I see? So, method one, is you, I can arrange it in whichever categories I want. The other ones, are all the other ones, I can't arrange it in the order I want? That's uh, the only one that you can do. Method two, you can uh, arrange. Okay. Because I, th I think most people like And the nice thing about arranging it, of course, is that if you want to be a particular class, you can move it into that. You don't want to be necessarily... I wouldn't might be entertaining to be the magic user with the 17 strength and the 11 intelligence. But no, I'm a method one guy. Okay. That's always what I use. I think it's probably because it was method one and it was simple. Yeah. So, can I roll? Make it happen. All right, let's do it. And I think I'll roll a method three, because, and we'll talk about the different methods. Go ahead. Okay. All right, so I've got... 14, it looks like. 14. Good. 14. Oh, another 14. Oh, that's not very good. 9. 10. Oh, 10. 3, 3, 4. Thank you. Yeah. We have to remember this is audio, so we probably should, even though you're getting the sound of the dice rolling. Oh, that's not good. They wouldn't want to lose, yeah, the excitement of knowing. <laughs> 9. <laughs> Seeing what I roll. Is that working the pen? Neither pen is working. Oh, that's not good. That's a 13. We'll have to work on that. Oh, 14. All right, that's very standard score. But, you know, that doesn't bother me at all. So I've got, what, three 14s, a 13, a 10, and a 9. Right, and and there is, 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 is it in uh, the Player's Handbook or somewhere, maybe it's in the Dungeon Master Guys, where they talk about hopeless characters? I would not consider this a hopeless yeah, character. Yeah, and so we can mention that real quick. Uh, if you have a score of 5 or lower... Mm -hmm. That's going to force you to be a particular class, right? Okay, because if you have right. a five or lower in a particular attribute, you can only be a particular class. So if you get a five or lower, you need to be very, you need to be aware of where you put that in which attribute. And if you have two fives or lower, 
you throw the character out. Right. Oh, that, okay. that character is not adventuring because that character cannot be any of the character classes. In, in theory, if you rules is written based on the fact that each uh, ability score has a minimum that says you can only be this. If you have two of them that way, you basically precluded all of them. You are precluded. Yep. Yep. Okay. Two, two fives and below, and uh, you're done. Sounds good. So now you have these character, you have these attributes. So what's your thoughts on that? I don't have a lot of thoughts on this, <laughs> uh, you know. I mean, so cer of course, certain things are going to be eliminated. You know, there are certain character classes that you have to have pretty high scores for. Right. The subclasses. Right. right? The, the paladin, the ranger, the illusionist, um, then a monk, which is not a subclass. I'm certainly not going to be a bard. So uh, bard is Appendix A. Are we are we going? Or is there a it's optional. Thing? It is. Right. It's an option. It is an optional thing, and one that has been the so source of mockery and confusion for, what, 30, 40 years almost, so uh, because of the, the way it is, and we'll have, I'm sure... Well, I also play gnomes, so well, I'm used to mockery. Okay, that's yeah. true. Yes. <laughs> wait, wait. It does, it's a moot point. I'm not being a bard. Okay. We don't have to cross that And you bridge. can't be a gnome bard, so thank goodness for that. You no, and I'm not going to be a gnome illusionist because I don't have the scores. So uh, that's, I mean, that's right. So if you, by looking through the pages, uh, you could be a cleric. You could be... Um, could you be... A, no, you could be... Let's see. You could be... You don't have any score above 15, correct? I do not. So you could not be a druid because you need a minimum of 15 charisma. So and I guess... That's some of the charm of this, in that um, other things with you know choice, analysis, paralysis, you really can limit based on the scores that you have. So you can't be a druid, you can be a cleric. I appreciate you trying to construe this as that's right. That's hey, good. This half, half, half full, half full, exactly. Appreciate that. So, um, but you know, the, this is some some of the charm of one e two. And again, I I don't know about other editions, but is that you get a pretty average character. Right. And they start average, and you slowly build them up over a long time. And that, that can be a lot of fun. How many um, uh, 13s and 14s do you have? I have three 14s and one 13. I already know what I'm going to be. Okay, you could be a ranger, I think. Oh, no, four, two, you need two 14s. No, yeah. I have two 14s. Yeah, you could be a strength of le not less than 13, intelligence not less than 13, a wisdom not less than 14, and 14 constitutions. So. Wow, I don't know why I always viewed ranger, held them in such high esteem. I... Well, that well, seems pretty easy to satisfy. Well, 13, 14, I mean, with the 46 method, you do skew higher than the average, which would be, what, 3.5 times 3, about 10 and a half. Um, and that's what's interesting about dice and the, and the oh. crunchiness of this is is it, it has this air of legitimacy. And again, reading this when I was, whatever, 13 or 14, when I first got the Dungeon Master's Guide and had the, you know, the bell curve and, and the right. statistics really felt, oh, this is a serious game for serious people. And yeah, I realize uh, I'm not so serious, but that's another story. Well, I think I, I think I've made my choice. Okay, so uh, of the classes in the player's handbook, what is now the other choice discussion is um, there's ways you can affect this. That's right. You can affect it by age and affect it by race. So maybe what, do you know the difference and what the options are with that? Um. So, yeah, so, I mean, we, we could look that up. I, I think I'm going to be... Is multi-class going to complicate things too much? No, I, I don't think so. I've always wanted to be a cleric ranger. Okay, so, um, that's another interesting topic here with first edition. For those who come in future editions, there, the, it, there's less and less penalty or constrictions or restrictions to... Uh, class and race. You can decide, I want to be an elf, and I can be a uh, ranger cleric, I could be a ranger illusionist, but in first edition, they are prescribed uh, multi-class combinations by race. There's certain things, so if you are going to be a cleric ranger, there's one uh, race that allows that. Do you know which race that is? That is a half-elf. That is correct, that's right. So, And what's the other challenge with being a half-elf cleric ranger? Oh, class limit. That's right. Class limit. Right. So right. what? Or why level why are there level limits from your? I like level limits. So I know this is very controversial. This is probably one of the most commonly uh, avoided uh, rules, right. right? By the book is level. I like level limits. You know, my understanding is 
and so when James is talking about level limits, we're talking about the fact that if you are if you're a human, there's no level limits. I think in any of them, right? right. You, you're unlimited in terms of your levels, in terms of your advancement. Unless the class had a limit, like druids and monks. Uh, oh, right, exactly. Uh, if you are a, a demi-human, elf, dwarf, half elf, gnome, halfling, then most of the time, not always, but most of the time you're going to be limited in terms of your advancement, how high you can go. Uh, in actual, in, so far as half-orcs, I think cleric, it's as low as four, and that's only probably if you have high wisdom. Uh, and that's so, correct. Re- my understanding of the reason of that is if you play a demi-human, you're going to get certain advantages that a human would not. So as a half-elf, my recollection, I have an increased chance of finding concealed doors and secret doors. Extra languages, surprising, there's a whole bunch of features. Exactly. So all, there's all these additional benefits to being a demi-human as opposed to human. So my understanding is Gary Gygus, to help maintain game balance and make sure everybody wasn't a demi-human, right. wanted to, needed to have a reason to push people toward playing humans, and so that... Uh, you know that what's being held out there is that unlimited advancement. So, but you know, we never played to eleventh. Well, maybe we played about eleventh across level. But we never right. got terribly high. Right. And so, especially with one e, with the attrition rate, the death rate, the death toll. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. I mean, if, you know, <laughs> the odds that you're going to get that high in a lot of these campaigns pretty low. So it never really bothered me. So yes, I'm absolutely fine with particularly our current campaign. Well, that's another story. Yes, exactly. <laughs> where no one can get past second level. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's part of the problem with never fudging roles, playing by the book, and playing adventures as written. Well it's a done. deadly combination. I, I didn't have a soapbox for you, but that was good. You rallied the troops. So that was excellent. So, so yeah, I'm excited to be a cleric ranger. I, I do accept the fact that I will be limited in levels. So that's on page 14 of the Player's Handbook, and it is, um, it is the page that giveth and taketh away. So uh, it talks about the racial benefits for certain races that have either a bonus to strength, or or, uh, constitution, orcs and dwarves and elves and halflings receive benefits, but it also has the level limits, and as Dan said, that has really been um, a lot of consternation for players. They they want the advantages, or they they want to be something different than a human. I mean, that's part of the fantasy when you're playing role-playing. You don't want to be just some schlep that you are today. Excuse me, at least for me personally. That may not apply to you, sir. But, uh, you know, and then the challenge is you end up with uh, something that feels contradictory to whether it's uh, the, uh, the Dungeon Masters or at least the, the style of First Edition, which is a human-centric thing. So um, you're going to be a half-elf. Uh, your character is going to be a half-elf ranger cleric. So uh, you, there's no racial changes to your attributes. Yeah, which is interesting. You know, and you notice too, there's no changes for gnomes either, which I also I was there found shouldn't that odd. be a gnomes at all. They are. And you think that's what that was? I think it was an afterthought. Someone must have lost the bet, but that's my own personal opinion. But however, um, I'm in the minority in in the people that we work that we play with because there's a number of folks who love playing gnomes. So I just need to accept my residents and seeing them playing and just accept it. I should have played it now. You should. Right here. So yeah, so page 14, Player's Handbook, right, it's got the level limits, it's also got the racial adjustments uh, to the attributes, half-elf, I don't have any. Uh, keep in mind, too, that the, uh, sometimes how high you can go in a particular level, a particular class, is dictated by your ability scores. Correct. Right? right. So, and I don't know if that's the case here with a half-elf Cleric, uh, Ranger, now it looks like I'm 5th level on Cleric, it doesn't matter what my attributes are, uh, and Ranger. Ranger's 8th level, but there are some limitations to that. Right, so which I wanted to, so half elf fighters of less than 17 strength are limited to 6th level, so right there, so I, I can be a Ranger, right. but my low attributes are going to come back to cause me some issues, because right. it's really going to limit. You're going to be 6th level. Six, uh, hopefully. Six level if ranger, lucky. fifth level cleric. If I'm lucky. Right. And um, another thing that we'll have to talk about is experience points and the challenge that um, one of the reasons players really despise level limits is once, if so, if you're multi class, in your case, cleric ranger, uh, you can only, your, your character can go only go to fifth level in cleric. And once you hit that, even though you can gain another level in ranger, 
you still are, uh, the cleric level is still eating up experience points. So it's actually taking twice as long now in Ranger to do that, and you're not getting any benefit, which is extremely frustrating. But And which brings up, a, I think, a more fundamental issue, too, is when deciding upon what class you're going to play. Yeah. Multi-class sounds awesome. Right. I get to be both a cleric and a ranger, but uh, as James was just talking about, even before, of course, you said when you reach the maximum one, you still have to do the half, which of course means that you're you're splitting up your experience points all the way through, starting at first level. All the experience points that you're getting are being divided equally amongst each of your classes, so right. your movement as a multi-class character is going to be slow. So you may want to consider being just a single class if you're looking to advance quickly. Right, in terms of But level. if you have no money and, and you never go back to town, that's another issue. But that's that's something for here. So, okay. So, uh, you get no racial uh, changes to your statistics. We'll, re we'll roll your age in a second. Um, so, do you have a name for your cleric ranger? I don't. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm preference... Uh, well, what, when we were young, it was always Strider or that Bob the Ranger because we weren't very creative and now as we've gotten older we try to leverage uh, that. Uh, let's see, what was your, you've always played a gnome illusionist so I'm always, it's always some kind of G thing so uh, what would be a good half-elf ranger cleric name? Glade, what was it, is it Glade? Glade, like, yeah. like you hang out in the Glade? Yeah, exactly, Glade. So, so, so how about, um, how about Glade Leaf Trotter? Oh. I don't know why anyone would trot on leaves or whatever, but how about Glade Leaf Trotter? That, that sounds good. It, it has uh, the connotation that um, you can glide over them. Or Glade Leaf Glider. Glade. Well, there's too many Gs there. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. Uh, so Glade Leaf Trotter. I'm not offended much by that. So We're going to need a pen that works. Okay. Hard. You keep going. Okay. I'm going to get a pen for you. So I'm going to be Glade Leaf Trotter. So one of the things you want to look at then is on the very next page, on page 15, it has the minimum and maximum attribute scores. Right. And I think a lot of people forget to look at this. So I think we've had, thank you. I think we've had characters at times where you're playing the character and then you realize, oh, they don't have the minimum whatever to be that race. So True. when you're going to put your attributes in the sixth category, and I did method one, so the good news is, I can put these attributes in any of the six ability scores I want, right. but I'm going to want to keep an eye on page 15 of the player's handbook under half elf just to make sure that I'm complying with the minimum and maximum. It's, half elf's pretty easy. I mean, yeah. it's, your maximums are almost always, what I think they're actually, if you're, as long as you're a male half elf, they're always 18. The minimum, you just need to look at a six dexterity and a six con. That's going to be easy. Some of the tougher ones are things like half orc, where right. your maximum wisdom is 14. Right. Which can really make it tough to be. You can be a cleric, half orc, but your wisdom's not going to be very high. Yeah, and dwarf and half orc minimum constitution. I guess it's assumed if you're playing a dwarf or half elf, or excuse me, half orc, you would want to have a high constitution because they get a racial benefit to it. But uh, if you decide to have a, car a half orc who's very frail, uh, the minimum will not really allow it. You're going to be exceptional, at least from a bell curve perspective. A minimum of 13 is required to do that. So right, exactly. Okay. So how do you want to arrange them? Okay, so you want to think about what the prime requisites are for each character class. So for Ranger, which is a subclass of Fighter, of course strength is going to be important, and I'm a Cleric. A Cleric wisdom is important. If you're a Magic user, it's intelligence. Uh, if you're a Thief, it's dexterity. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to take two of my 14s, put one in strength and one in wisdom. Right. And then I've got another 14. You know, I'm a, a ranger. I Well, you know, rangers like, uh, you know, well, high dexterity can help you with missile attacks, so I don't know that I've got a high enough dexterity to well, make my, a difference. My thought would be, uh, and again, for folks who are coming into this from other uh, editions, later editions, um, really, for most uh, attributes, you have to be above 14 to start seeing a benefit uh, for most uh, attributes. So strength, you don't get a bonus to either damage until uh, 15 or 16. Intelligence, there really is no benefit. Uh, uh,
mechanically, but it does help with languages or spell acquisition and memorization. Wisdom is important for clerics because they get bonus spells depending on that, so I agree with you putting 14 there. Constitution, because you may be uh, mature and then there's a benefit to age, Putting a 14 there, if it raises to 15, you would actually get a plus one to your hit points. Yeah, would I get this 15 dexterity get me something? 15 does get you. On the AC? Uh, on minus one to AC. Okay, so the good news, oh, but I, that's right, but the age is not, dexterity is not, you're right. So James, James brought up a really good point, which is you can be pretty strategic about this. If you're using the adjustments based on age, and I think a lot of people didn't do that back in the day. Right. right? They, I think they forgot or didn't know about it, to be perfect last. And those are in the Dungeon Master's Guide, page 13. Yeah, so the reality is, so some of the things that you would need to roll up your character are going to be found not only in the player's handbook, but they'll be found in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And the age, using the age chart is really nice because it, I think it almost always increases right. your attributes. So that's a really good point. So since I know that a 15 constitution is going to give me some benefits, more so than a a dexterity just a 14 because you don't need that nice magic number 15. I'm going to go ahead and put a 14 in con, assuming that my age adjustment is going to help me get that up. I'm going to put a 13 in dex. Yep. You know what I'm going to do? I envision, I know it's a little unusual, people almost always, it seems to me, unless they need to have a high charisma, they have charisma low. I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to have a 10 charisma because that's the way I view myself, and a 9 intelligence so if you're did I have average intelligence did I have everything I needed to be to be a ranger that's another thing is yeah it? so let me confirm that I think intelligence may need to be a little bit higher to be if I recall but let me confirm that okay so ranger must have a strength not less than 13 intelligence not less than 13 oh see. wisdom not less than 14 and 14 or greater constitution oh so what I need to do is hold on so I need to make this, I need to take this 14, all right, all right, let's, I'm going to put the 9 on Charisma for now. Right. All right. Okay, so I need to have, all right, 14 Strength, so I'm good. I needed a right. 14 Wisdom, did you say? You need a uh, Wisdom not less than 14. Okay, so that. 14 Con. Okay, so the 14 Wisdom. Right. Because I knew age is going to probably be a wash on that. I need a 14 Con. Yep. So, oh, well, I could do, I could do the 13 con. We could do the 14 con and yeah. then give yourself 13 intelligence because you had a 13, you would just take out a dex. So your dex is going to be less in this case. Yeah. So and then your dumps, so what's a dump stat? The stat that's not important, you take your uh, attributes that you didn't score well and put them in ones that won't affect you. So you need to have, um, so again, intelligence not less than 13. So you'd have to... You'd have to right. put 13 in your intelligence. Right, and so and dex, cons. dex and cons and are going to be the ones that... 10 9. Got it, got it. All right, well, I'm doing a dex of 10. Right. And, and the so there it ends up with the From charisma. a mechanical perspective, and this is always a challenge, too, because I'm sure some, some of the folks here are going to be like, oh, wow, they're trying to power game or maximize it. It's just, um, you know, that's certainly up to Dan um, to decide where he wants to put it. But if he wants to be a ranger and uh, hit the attributes, it does constrain some of that, which, again, for me, allows... Um, choice analysis paralysis is eliminated by that. He, he has stats, and now he can start formulating, okay, he's, a, he's, he's got this character. It's probably going to be more heavily armored than a traditional ranger, maybe, at least in the strider perspective of someone who's stealthy. Um, so he's going to start formulating how, what his character's backstory is without having to start with the backstory and then try to figure out the character, which, again, is, is, a, is a play of style that... Uh, Dan and I find very appealing. Okay. Okay, what's up next? So, well, now we need to do your uh, age, height, and weight, and then we can roll your hit points since okay. you've done that. Okay. So on page 13 of the, uh, page 12 and 13 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, it talks about character age, aging, disease, and death. So what's, the, there is another ad, advantage uh, to being multi-class in some ways is that uh, you get uh, a higher age, which makes sure, ensures that you are mature or above. Um, I typically play clerics because no one else wants to play them, and that's another story. And if you're a human cleric, it's very hard to get to mature. And there is a penalty. If you're not mature, you don't 
uh, you lose a point of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Because you lose a point of wisdom, which is the main attribute for clerics, it's, it's a whammy. The last three clerics have been 19 years old or 20 years old. I've lost a point of wisdom. That's one less bonus spell I have. So, uh, so you're a half-elf, correct? I am. And uh, what it says here, for multi-class characters, use the column which develops the highest age and use the greatest possible addition to the base age. Do not generate the age variable by a random die roll, but instead assign the maximum. So, as a half-elf, uh, you have, as a cleric, you, you would be 48 years old. As a fighter, you would be 34 years old. So you are 48 years old. And that makes sense to me. I assumed that you do the max for the higher one, since you're multi-class. Right. You know, the characters start, when you start at level one, there's this assumption that you've been through training just to reach level one. Right. And so I always assumed it took you that many years to train both here to be a cleric and That's to be right. a ranger. And, yeah. and so the good thing about the age tables is that most starting characters are, you know, you have different categories, young, adult, mature, middle-aged, old, and venerable. Most characters seem to start at mature, and the great thing about that is then you are going to end up adding a point of strength and a point of constitution. That's right. And the, it was something you want to remember is that these are all cumulative. So it's assuming you've been through young adult. So young adult is at, subtract a point of wisdom from mature is at a point of wisdom. So that's a wash. Right. And you get the benefit of both the plus one to con on young adult and the plus one to strength on mature. Yeah. So I get strength and con here, right? So my strength right. is going to go up to 15. Exactly. And my con, my constitution is going to go up to 15. What I also was interesting is you have to know your class in order to roll your age. Yeah. But you are getting additions to your points, your attributes as a result of age. So sometimes you don't, you know, you would you could peek at the age table. Right. And I guess say, well, I'm hoping if I know I'll make it into this age range, I'll be able to be this class because I'm going to be mature right. and I'll get the points. So it's a little... It's a little weird to yeah. me that way, but okay. And in the cleric example, if you're a human cleric, and let's say I roll terribly, but I'm still trying to plow through it, and my highest stat is, is uh, a nine or something, and if I don't roll high enough age, I could lose a point of wisdom and then not meet the minimum for wisdom, and then I would basically have to start over again. Yes, I guess. Yes, I guess you. Well, you keep this. I guess you'd keep the scores, but right. have to try to pick another class right. and do the age roll, or have some cast haste on me, or maybe see a ghost. Maybe there's a ghost in the local crypt and have them scare me for ten years, or something to that effect. But uh, that's neat. But we don't have that. I don't have that. Glade Leaf Trotter doesn't have any of those problems. That's right. So you're you're being very uh, strategic in your plans. That's very good. Taking the scores that you have and trying to at least. Uh, have some attributes that uh, that are not only playable but have some exceptional things. So, okay. So the next uh, thing you normally we would roll is age, weight, and then also we would have um, your starting money because that's how you figure out your uh, what equipment that you have. And now the height and weight again. I correct me from we've got to go to the dungeon master's guy you're That's not right. going to find the player's handbook and actually what you have to use is the table for non-player characters That's but right. i i know there's somewhere i don't know if it was dragon magazine or somewhere they say specifically yeah refer to those tables so just because npc you still would use that table and don't underestimate the importance of rolling your height and weight because i know james i know we've seen this in our games is that something happens and the DM said, the dungeon master says, well, what's your height? Right. Or what's your weight? And the person says, I don't know. Yeah. So you should definitely roll that up because it does become relevant at times. I, I think that's always been an interesting thing. The, um, when we, at least when I was younger, we would just roll the, the absolute minimum to get playing. The stats, the sure. hit points. We didn't even worry about, I think we probably missed in the DMG about uh, age changing your thing so we would just put the minimum we were more focused on what our hit points was what our armor class was which is the ability to be hit and what magic items you have uh, as we've matured i think fleshing out the character which again the height and weight seems kind of a, an interesting thing but it adds not only to role playing but there are there is what what would happen in yesterday's game that we had we were trying to drag a couple of injured characters out and uh, uh, dan, uh, dan and ed who were co-dming last session they were asking the player how much uh, 
how much do these guys weigh because you can only pull so much strength. So you're exactly right. All right. Uh, height and weight. So you are, oh, you know, I, I, sh I didn't, I shouldn't, we forgot one other critical thing. Your gender. Very true. Very true. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be uh, female. Okay. So, you know, this is in, in 2019, which again, Happy New Year, by the way. Uh, in 2019, it seems like a very antiquated or from a different time, but there are gender limits here, and I know many people excuse them, but eschew them. Uh, but male and female had different racial minimums and maximums, so I don't think it affects you here. But if you were particularly in strength, uh, many of the female uh, gendered races have a less maximum strength. Uh, but in this case, that's not going to affect you, so you're going to be a male character. Oh, female. Oh, female, excuse me. I'm huh? female. Okay, so I'm just going to confirm, half elf, your maximum 17 strength, 18, 18, 18, 18, and 18. So the only one that would be different is, uh, is strength, if that. And again, those were, you know, we didn't even think about it then, and so it's, I'm, I'm glad we are progressing, uh, but, um, you know, that, that is that thing of potentially some folks would be like, well, why, why are we having, well, that was... The thought process back then was no uh, female could get to that, and, and later editions have changed it. I don't think it's been a big deal, um, and certainly, uh, you know, that would be something as a dungeon master. If someone rolled an exceptional female character, I wouldn't have a problem with it, because again, these are potentially exceptional characters, but that is part of the rules as written. Okay, so you are a female, uh, half out. So, uh, you have to roll a D100 or a 2D10 to roll percentages to figure out whether uh, the average weight, excuse me, average height for a, a half elf is 100 inches. And, and oh, excuse me, weight, I apologize, 62 inches. And at some point we need to talk about people who have hundreds of dice and people who come to a game with one set of dice. That's right. Well, I'm a one set person. Okay. Well, as a dungeon master, the, the dice themselves, they, they had multifunctions. They were the monsters. They were... Oh, uh, they okay. Also, I had many people who would come, and they wouldn't have dice, and I wouldn't want them to touch my dice. I mean, that yeah, I guess, yeah. you don't want players touching your dice, Dan. You want to have, have... So that was the thing. So yeah. roll 100. Okay. 92. 92. So for height, uh, you are above, which means for a half-elf... Uh, you have an exceptional height. So for average height, so in this case, you would roll, your average is 62 for a female, 62 inches, okay. and you add a D6 to that. Okay. And what page number are you on? Oh, thank you. Yes, page 102 in the Dungeon Master's okay. Guide. Three? Three, so you're 65 inches. So you're at 5 foot 5? Yeah, right, because, yeah. Yeah, 5 foot 5. Okay. Uh, roll percentage again for your weight. Your average is 100 pounds. 19? 19. You're underweight. What? This is very strange. A si I have a slender character. Right. Who would have thought it? Right. But, but the char this character is tall, which is... Right. Un I'm more like a halfling. Yeah. Uh, or a gnome. <laughs> I wouldn't make you a halfling. That's... that's I, I'm, I'm a halfling with a gnome personality. That's it. That's okay. it. I pre That's true. <laughs> so, you're, so you're underweight. Is that correct? That's, that's what you said. Yes, that's true. So in this case, uh, roll a d12 and subtract that from 100. What a game. D12. There you go. That's the track. Wow. 12. You are, you are 88 pounds. Your character, is, 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 Glade, is 88 wait, pounds. Wait. This, this, this is me. Yes. It's 5 foot 5, 88 pounds. Yes. Where else? Okay. A half elf. You, uh, you, you skew more to the elf than the human. Or, this, or this. someone in your family has had relations with an elf and that's what they would produce. Right, that's a different Now, is it Glade podcast. or Gladys at this point? Is it's Glade. Glade. Okay, okay. It's Glade. Glade is a very maleish kind of thing, but okay. There's a backstory there. See, okay. it's developing. I see. Okay. Right? There's going to be a backstory there. I got it. Right? I got it. Okay. It could be a nickname. I like it. It could be Gladys, and I go by Glade. Yes. Well, right? it sounds tougher, because you are a ranger. The lightweight is going to help me, because if I'm down, mm -hmm. I'm easy to get out of there. Right. We learned that last session. You want to be light right. when... when when the party is fleeing the dungeon and yeah. you've been knocked unconscious, you want to be light. You are a rag doll. You are so easy <laughs> yes. to carry around that will not be an issue. Perfect. All Excellent. right. Okay. Okay. 
So you are a female half elf ranger cleric um, who's five foot five and eighty eight pounds. Yeah. So now we're at one of the most important roles, which is hit points. Yeah. And so um, there is basically three or four options to hit points. There is what we consider the right way, which is what's the right way to roll hit points. You mean the by the book way? Right. You, you, well, it's just that. You roll for hit points, right. including your starting hit points. Right. None of this... Well, I assume we're going to talk about uh, this common house rule that's used yes. There's what, first and, level. And it was codified in those later editions. But I don't know anything about that. That's right. You wouldn't know. You, your, your memory stopped uh, before that. Yeah. Um, so it is rules as written is you roll. Um, and again, for a normal character who has one class, you would roll one dice depending on the class that it was. And whatever it is, that's how many hit points, only modified by your constitution uh, bonus or penalty, depending on what it is. Now, we have two interesting things happening here. Yes. Number one, I'm a ranger. That's right. He's the only class which starts out with two rolls. Well, the monk has as well. Oh, okay. And the monk. And uh, a multi-class. That's right. So we're going to average them. Is that correct? Yeah, so the rule for multi-class in first edition is you take... Uh, you roll the, for each class, you roll their dice, and you add your constitution bonus, and you divide, and then you roll. You roll add them. the con each time. Right. Right. And you Because know, in this case, it's unique because you have three dice you're rolling. You're rolling two D8, two eight-sided dice for ranger. Adding my con. Right. And then adding your con, then adding one D8 for your cleric. So you're basically going to roll three eight-sided dice, add three, and divide it by two, round up. Add three or add two? So uh, so it's, it's so on the con oh so I get the con for each dice on the on the ranger that's correct I learned something yes. okay and you know and this is so it can be a little bit weird with have I picked up that was a d10 I'm giving you oh idea. thank you they, they look they look similar they look so similar so you can be we had a ranger with three hip starting hit points yes right Gareth had three hit points three right? hit two points as a ranger and he had no con no bonus point. I believe right. and so there it was and so you're a frontline fighter of three hit points okay. So what are the rolls you roll? So I have 10 plus 3 is, is 13. Divide by, by 2. two is we six round and up on hit points, yeah. my understanding, right? Six, so you have 7 points. Not bad. Not bad. That's not bad for right. level 1. Yes, when my uh, cleric that I'm running right now has 2 hit points. 2. 2 for those. I'm holding 2 fingers up just in case. So, you know, so, um, and I was hit for uh, substantial damage last time, but I did not die, fortunately, which we'll talk about death and dying another time. Yeah. So you have 7 hit points. Uh, so that's that is overall uh, pretty good. Now the average. So the other choices are uh, you could do basically uh, average. The dungeon master could say you can uh, choose the average or roll, um, and that's typically how I do it for first level. That's how that's a house rule, though, right? That is a house rule. Later editions have that you can you either get the minimum, and then even future editions they give maximum that. So. Again, it depends on uh, the style of play and also um, how deadly the game you want it to be. Okay, uh, so we are doing it by the book, which I think is great. So we have seven points, and then uh, you wrote down alignment. Um, so quickly, Dan, what's your understanding of alignment and why it's important in, in Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition? Well, I think alignment is very important. And I will tell you, I think that player characters myself included when I'm playing, perhaps don't use alignment as much as, as, as I'd like to see. So alignment is one's ethical view of the world, the way the character views, the way things should be, right? Of course, we have two different categories. You have, are you going to be good, neutral, or evil? And then in addition to that, you have to decide whether you are lawful, chaotic, or neutral. Uh, lawful, of course, you like uh, order and structure and there's hierarchy. Yeah. Um, so you can be evil and lawful. I mean, lawful, evil. Right. You believe in hierarchy and structure. And chaotic, uh, you believe uh, less in rules. Uh, and so I think most characters, they like to be chaotic, neutral right. players. Well, we've, we've ascribed uh, in playing chaotic neutral being selfish, the Han Solo type of pre-helping the uh, rebellion, that what's in it for me, I'll be helpful when it suits my purposes, but I'm also not uh, bound, honor-bound to do anything for anyone else. And let me ask you, so I'm going to, I have to, certain character classes have to be certain alignments. That's correct. Right, a ranger has to be good. Right. 
Uh, so I have to be a good aligned cleric can be anything. That's right. right. So unless neutral, because again there was that discussion at one point for a while. A neutral, a neutral cleric could only be a, druid. a druid. Neutral cleric is a druid. That's right. <laughs> but then later there came up neutral clerics. I think that it's depending on the deity and the and the milieu mm. that you would. Because I know there are some campaigns. Uh, for, so, for instance, Greyhawk had Bokob Van Karen, who was neutral, and his clerics would be neutral. But it, it appears that if you are a neutral cleric, uh, neutral line cleric, you, you were supposed to be a druid, because that was they were focused. They did not have a bent towards any morality beyond all moralities were accepted at the same time. And we should note too, I think it's just popping in my mind, is that when selecting alignments, I think that the party. I think there's this tendency that you're going to roll up your character, yeah, and you'll pick your alignment, and then when everyone's done, let's say you have a session zero, everyone's done doing that, you then start playing, and there's no discussion about, well, what alignment we should do. And I understand why sometimes people wouldn't want to do that, because you may not want to just know what other people's alignments it's are. It's very rude. It's very rude to ask right. about that. You may want to learn about it and play. But on the other hand, I think, you know, if you have a group that has, say, like in our party, uh, we've got one, I think, one good character, two good characters, and the rest are all neutral. You can have some real tension there, which is great if you want to play it out. But my sense is, if you're going to have a character with disparate alignments, you probably, as the player, should be playing out that you see playing out that tension. You see a part of your lawful good, and you see somebody chaotic neutral doing something that's not lawful good. I would think you'd complain about it, perhaps. Um, but I don't have to worry about that because I am on my own. Right. Play, and you're, and you're good. Trotter. I'm right. going to be neutral good. Neutral good. So what does that mean in, from your perspective? So to, from my perspective, that means that I what I care about is good. I want to do good. I don't care so much about whether or not the society is going to be structured with a hierarchy and a lot of rules or whether it's freewheeling and chaotic. My What I value is I don't care about that. I just want to make sure that good triumphs over evil. Yeah. That's what I'm out for. So I'm going to be, if I'm, if I am adventuring with somebody who's neutral as opposed to good, I may have ultimately some issues uh, right. with that person. Um, and, and so on page 33, alignment again is one of those um, really inventions, I think, of, of Dungeons and Dragons. And again, based on the history of how it came. And it's one of the most contentious, and, and as dungeon masters, we have to set early on in that session zero, like we talked about, which is when you're setting up the game. Many games, people show up, they roll characters, and they start playing. But there's definitely things, I, I agree, of having a, at least a meeting or conversation with your players and kind of setting the campaign, setting the expectations uh, in that session zero before you start playing. And one of them is how stringent you're going to use alignment, because uh, I agree with you, alignment is very important. And unfortunately, it's up to the dungeon master for the most uh, cases to really uh, hold characters accountable to their alignment. And again, the alignment doesn't dictate behavior. The behavior dictates the alignment. You can write anything on your sheet if, if, you, uh, if you do not play Glade as someone who's ultimately seeking goodness and you're just murdering everyone and stealing. Well, you're not neutral good. And eventually, there's a penalty if, if you... Uh, derivate too far from your alignment, what would happen to you as, as a ranger? And I think down the road, we probably should do a podcast on alignments yeah, yeah. because, you know, there's a lot of interesting That'll things. That'll be a five-hour thing. It will be, you know, because <laughs> this idea that, you know, it's absolutely okay for a paladin to kill right. an evil creature. Right. You don't have to give mercy, right? Yeah, I mean, and, right. And, and, you know, and, 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 and rangers are probably the same. Uh, you know, they, they, no problem killing an evil creature. Um, torture is a different story. Right, exactly. Torture is a different and story. what is torture, right? So we'd have to go into that too. So there's, there's a lot of discussions about that. And one quick note too on alignment. When selecting alignment and when the party's selecting alignment, if somebody wants to be a paladin, right, right, which is sort of this right, holy knight, right, very religious, crusader type. And there's a lot of mechanical advantages to being a paladin. They are, for a first, they are way better than a first level fighter. Yeah. There's a lot of features that uh, help in the dungeon. So there's... A lot of players gravitate towards them because they provide a lot of such uh, uh, in-game benefits. Yeah, they, they, they're, they're a great character class, but what I think people sometimes forget is that a paladin will not go on an adventure with neutral characters, I think, more than once. That is correct. So if somebody's going to be, somebody says, hey, I want to be a paladin, I've got the roles, my heart is set on being a paladin, 
when the party is rolling up a line, uh, rolling up characters, yeah. picking alignments, you got to have a discussion that okay, that's a, no, everyone's this got to be a good party then because yeah. that paladin is gonna it will take off after one adventure. Or the neutral guy has to hide and try to conceal his alignment or her alignment as long as possible, and and then later reveal it, which again is 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 a challenge. We have a paladin in the game that I run, and there's a couple of neutral characters, and as he has figured out that they're neutral, we have to continue to put that tension, and how does he square square the uh, edict that a paladin should not be uh, associating with ca uh, characters who don't share the same outlook. Right. And I have a quick note, too, on these, because we talked about how certain character classes have to have certain alignments. Rangers have to be good. Right. Thieves have to be neutral, and but, and I know a lot of people think this is very strange. I think it's strange, but I play by the book. Uh, you can be a neutral. Uh, the book says in rare instances, which of course means a player character is anytime you want. Right. In, in all be, instances. Can be neutral good. <laughs> and I always assumed it was, you know, strangely enough, simply because the word neutral right. was there, which of right. course doesn't make a lot of sense. But by the book, thieves can be neutral good. So if you do have a paladin, that doesn't mean a paladin, you can't have a thief in that party. The thief would just have to be neutral good. Right. Okay. All right. So we have that. So I think the last item is money. And, oh, actually, we have a couple other things. So, um, you know, uh, again, one of the things when I was playing, uh, we didn't focus on this, but there is opportunities through the rolling and the creation of the character to come up with a backstory. So a couple of other areas is the languages that you uh, start with as... Uh, as a first level character, and then depending on your race, you have additional languages, and then a um, secondary skill, which is, while it's not an emphasis or there's a not there's not a mechanical uh, change, uh, it does provide some background for your player that the dungeon master and the players can use during the adventure. So um, you're a half elf, you're a cleric, you're a ranger. As a half elf, you get a number of languages that are by default. And that's in the player's handbook. Yep, that's right? right. And I always thought this is very interesting because my recollection is that a lot of the demi-humans know think the languages like goblin, yep. um, right, or orc, which I always thought was quite fascinating. Like, when did I learn, is that, is this part of schooling? Yeah. Like, you, 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 instead of Spanish class, you just, yeah, yeah. if you're a ranger, I guess you just you study goblin. I mean, no, I'm sorry, you're you're a half elf. Right. Why do all half elves or whatever? Well, let's find out what we learn, and then we'll see if it's right. It so, is unusual. So as you look at page seventeen, says uh, all half elf characters are able to speak the common tongue, which again, common is the lingua franca of of whatever milieu you set up. Um, it's just called common, and their uh, alignment tongue, and the following. Elvish, Gnome, Halfling, Goblin, Hobgoblin, Orcish, and Knoll. And then Half-Elven characters above 16 are able to learn one additional language for every point of intelligence above 16. So you do not get any additional languages. However, you already know Common and your alignment language and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other... You know lot, nine languages at 48 And see, and that, that's what this is very interesting. It's like... All half elves just happen to learn hobgoblin, right? We yeah, just at some point in time it, you should know hobgoblin. It was an it's not an elective apparently. Apparently you that's <laughs> exactly you it's a, in a half elf school and and no one. This is one of those things. Don't ask why. Just be happy that you know them. And now my understanding is from the languages because I think this is something that was commonly misunderstood. Is my understanding is the additional languages based on intelligence is the number of additional languages I can learn, right? But I am expected. To actually learn those during, I don't just roll those. Right. You got to learn those during the campaign. You got to find someone to teach you the language. You don't just roll and get pixie. Right. Okay. Or, or you, the dungeon master could say yes. It, so if you have a very high intelligence that allows you the capacity to learn more, uh, even though a half elf who is uh, below intelligence would still have seven or eight languages, which again is very interesting. You could just be a, an ambassador at that point. Uh, the way I've typically done it is if if uh, I will allow a particular human who's highly intelligent to have one language. Then they would have to tell me how they acquired Pixie. How in uh, their backstory would they have gotten Pixie uh, to do that? If not, then, uh, as Dan said, during the game, you'd have to figure out, oh, there's, uh, you know, one of the NPCs is Dwarvish. You would have to say, okay, every time during break, 
uh, during downtime, I'm, I'm con trying to learn Dwarvish while as a human. And, you know, again, uh, based on our normal lives, that's, that takes months to do or years to even become somewhat proficient. And, and what's the level of proficiency of languages? You know, I think basic understanding and conversational is one thing, not, you know, re reading uh, legal texts in, in the language is another thing. Yeah, and I noticed here, I'd written down here on, in the DMG at 103, it says player characters generally should be required to learn foreign languages from others. So yeah, that, that certainly opens up the opportunity for the DM. If you've got a backstory, I guess, right. which lends itself to you knowing a particular language, the DM would have that discretion right. to say, yeah, okay, I'll give you that language. Exactly, or, exactly. Uh, and I, another quick note to it I thought was interesting too, is that my understanding is that not like let's say I run into a goblin. That goblin's not necessarily going to know common. Right. So it's not like and not all monsters, right, or humanoids are going to know common. Some may, but you know, don't assume that they're all going to know common. And let me tell you, knowing these languages, goblin, hobgoblin, they can come in into a lot of use. Right. In an adventure. And I think that's where um, that's the the balance that I think one e uh, and I'm sure other editions have it as well. Again, from my perspective, I've learned from 1E and my son plays 5th edition, so that's the only experience I really have. That's where 1E, um, you can be very war gamey, you know, not worry about, uh, uh, you know, all these other features. Or if you leverage the features that are in the, in the product, so for instance, we were engaging with goblins, you know, it, it's up to the DM to enforce. The goblin may not know, it's very unlikely they know common. And that requires the player characters if they have goblin to be to be able to converse with them and and that causes a challenge for the other players who don't know how to do that that's exactly right and see and this another benefit to not being a human you know right. all these lines are... well and which and that goes by if you don't put these rules in to at least promote humans most people because well, you'll end up with a table full of demi humans which again if that's the way you want it that's fine which we which is what happened with our first one of the one of the groups in the Pelinor campaign when right. I read it and I said no level limits I, or I can't remember one of the campaign and it was like one human right. yeah yeah uh, all right what do I do next so let's see we uh, we gave you um, we talked about uh, languages which again you have you have a secondary skill so we'll look that up and then we'll get your starting money I like rolling for secondary skills right so as James mentioned in the D you have to go to the dungeon master's guide or what at page 12 it looks like yep, page 12 there's a list of secondary skills and I think if I recall correctly the dungeon master's guide says the player character if they want can select one right maybe if it's part of their um, yeah. their backstory or I assume that's probably certainly okay to allow the player to do that but right. you can also roll I like rolling yeah. Because I like sort of forcing a backstory right. to an extent right. on me, and I like working it in there, so I'd like to roll. Yeah, you and I have the same perspective from that, which is we like the rolling to generate the character and some of the backstory, but it's perfectly acceptable, and it says assign a skill randomly or select according to the background of your campaign. So I think there still is the idea, and this is always the tension between the player who have this, you know, I want to be a drow elf whatever and the dungeon master saying well we don't have drow elves they're not they're not even allowed per se and that tension again the the thrust of the dungeon master's guide in the first edition from from gary gaiak is you know it's always in the idea of the campaign it's not you don't you you may have some ideas but it has to fit with the campaign so you're gonna roll i'm gonna roll and, and please roll for, have a secondary skill why yeah. wouldn't you want one because you never know one e is hard enough Right. I'm walking around with seven hit points. Yes. That secondary skill, it's possible. It could come in handy. That's it could right. save my life. You just never know. So I'm going to roll it. Excellent. All right, 38. 38. Well, congratulations. You are a limner slash painter. I don't even know. How do I spell limner? L-I-M-N-E-R. Well, I would have guessed that. Now, the next question is, what's a limner? I have no idea, but I... I Do you I, know you're even pronouncing it correctly? Well, Are you sure it's not limner? A limner? I don't know. I don't know. It's limner. We don't know what a limner is. But we know what a painter is. I don't know what I am. Well, you're a painter. I'm a painter. See, this is great. So we'd have to look this up. And, and when I was 13 and 12, this was 
how some of my vocabulary came to be, because I'd be like, what is that? And we'd have to look it up. Well, the backstory is clearly coming together. Do you know why I'm an adventurer? I don't know why you're an adventurer. Because I don't want to be a painter. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's usually, That's right. your secondary skill will usually be the reason you're an adventurer. That's right. Okay, perfect. I'm you, a painter. For 48 years, you, were le- you had some droning languages in the back as you were painting. Yeah. And... Uh, you were hot, in the woods and you'd escape. Hot on tape, you mean, right. kind of? Right, right. Yeah. You'd be, a, you'd be a scape, there'd be magic mouse in the, in the elvish forest. You probably were part of the elvish area. You were in some kind of lands between elves and humans, because that's how you became half-elf. You were forced to paint, and uh, you, you realized this wasn't I'm, for you. There could have been a stranger in town one night. Well, you yeah, know. Yeah, right, coming through. Yeah. That's true. Well, you know, that, right. that could be part of the thing. So, uh, last thing we have is starting money. All right, now, I don't know if you want to talk about poly, the polyhedron, okay. right? which was the sage advice equivalent yeah. of the Role Playing Game Association newsletter, right. right? Or the polyhedron was the newsletter. Right. Had something on there where they gave, right, the, the polyhedron would give what they said were official rulings. Mm-hmm. And polyhedron indicates that multi-class characters combined the starting money. Wow. Of e- yes, of each of their classes. I think this is not what... It's never mentioned in, in the player's handbook or the DMG, right? It's never talked about how you do that. And I think most people back in the day right. probably averaged. Uh, I'm going to lobby here today to <laughs> DM James. To, to, you know, polyhedron are official rules. Right? Yes. Um, and, and, and it says I get extra money, and if you need any convincing, mm-hmm. uh, my theory would be that in order to become two classes, I have to train in both classes, so you must have had a decent sum of money. I mean, you could say, well, you spent it all on two classes. Right. But so I'm going to lobby for the polyhedron rule. I don't know what you're, if you're going to give it to me. So you get the maximum of, you get the role of both? I get the role of both. Okay. You combine the starting money of each of the classes. And you do not uh, add, you do not divide. You do not divide. You combine. I think that's fair, um, especially if, uh, you know, one of the challenges is the, the main cost for a starting character is their armor. Uh, the high, the, if you want to get some exceptional armor beyond leather and, and more of the common armor. You know, so th- in your case, a cleric and fighter, you, you could have potentially some substantial money. But I'm going to hope that the dice are not going to roll so great, so it'll be in the wash. So yes, I will allow you to roll. And see, that's, that's a typical DM response right, right there. That's You're right. rooting against me. I think it was called the Spell Illusion, I think. It was the Sage Advice equivalent policy. Mm-hmm. But, but Sage Advice, not binding. Okay. The Spell Illusion, binding. Okay, okay. great. I, I, will, I will accept uh, that argument. Um, you just you gotta you gotta come with you gotta come with your rules when you're dealing with the DM, right. you know. You but rules is written says you know the tr- your character is unusual, exceptional, and compared to the norm. This and that's one of the reasons this ab- applies to abilities as funds. He or she will have a large supply of coins, which purchase equipment, possible g- gold coins, with which a player begins depends on the character class. So again, a multi class it doesn't define it. I will do some research, and the other advantage too is if this is something that I'm very concerned about. Uh, you know, that's where in the age of the internet I could go and look beside Sage Advice and look at other things. And Dragon's Foot, Dragon's a great Foot. resource. That's right. So, but uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with that because, you know, uh, if, if you're playing, a, it encourages players to buy equipment that can help them in the dungeon versus only uh, relying on their skills and their abilities, but they actually could have equipment. Now, and then the other issues, you have encumbrance, which will be another topic uh, which we don't have time to talk about, but you, you, there is a physical limit to how much glades can carry, and so if she decides to carry too much stuff, that could impede her, uh, her ability to move, her surprise issues, and all the other things. So yes, roll your roll your gold. Piece. Okay, so what do I roll for fighter? So uh, so fighter, it is five d four, and you multiply that by ten, the the added result. Five d four. Right. All right. So we have to three. Oh, this is old school, right? Yeah. On the bottom. Right? One. That's right. We don't have those fancy dice. Four. Well, I'm sure I have some. Uh, two. two. And one. Okay, so that's four, eight, ten, eleven. So you have 110. You multiply that by ten. And then for uh, cleric, it's 3d6. Okay. Oh, very good. So you have 12. 12. So it's 120. So you end up with 
how much did you end up? 230. 230. Okay. So, which is 30 gold pieces more than the maximum for the for a fighter. Which is, uh, it's reasonable. I, I can sense the tone. Yeah, it's, well, it, it, it does not allow at least for plate mail or, uh, you know, which is 400 gold pieces in the player's handbook. The, the starting price is, is 35 gold pieces. Now, another DM trick could be, these are the suggested prices. These are the recommended prices within the thing. We could start the campaign in a town where everything is doubled. So the, the Borderlands prices, I right? Think, I think he's keeping the Borderlands. Uh, everything's like ten percent higher. 10%, or something. 20, I can't 20. remember. Maybe I just did that. I don't know. So you know, that's a a very traditional uh, dungeon master perspective, which is in order to uh, reduce one ability, reduce everyone's ability. So you know, for your benefit, everyone else would be damaged because yeah. I would raise the price by thirty percent. So you you have your ways, right? Yeah. So everyone else who got normal amounts, they actually would get less because you wanted extra. So that's good. That's not a problem. I like it. Uh, can we talk a little bit about uh, a patron deity? Or well, so I'm a cleric, you, so yes. it's essential. That's right. But I just I wanted to talk a little bit about even if you are not a cleric, I think you should have a deity. Right. I think right. I mean the the deities and demigods says that serving a deity is a significant part of AD and D, and all player characters should have a patron god. So I think that's very important and something right. I don't see played up as much as I would, would like, which is characters having a deity, yep. mentioning continually that you're worshipping that deity. And let me tell you, that could come in handy. I know divine intervention is not a big thing in first edition. You know, you're not going to pray and your deity's going to appear. But if I recall correctly, in the deities and demigods book, there's some sort of indication that if you've been really faithful there's maybe, say, a 10% chance that some small creature will be sent to help you. My point is, if you have a deity and you worship your deity on a routine basis, if it looks like you're going to die, maybe it gives you a shot at a roll, a little bit of help. Again, something to maybe help keep you alive. Oh, I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, for me, and we'll talk about alignment in another podcast, but I'm always of the opinion that alignment doesn't make a whole lot of sense outside of a deity because you could look at the alignments and while the player's handbook and the dungeon master's guys provide some guidance of how to play that alignment uh, and what it means to the character it's really the deity which locks in the behavior because again using modern or just history um, people's behaviors were affected by the religion and the deities that they worshipped. And if you don't have that, then you have more of a moral compass, which again, um, the, the reason it's so important is because in first edition D&D, there are penalties to changing alignment once you get past a certain level. You basically have, you have defined your ethos, and if you change and your deity, you move away from your deity because you're moving away from your alignment, there's penalties to that. So I totally agree. Yeah, and I noticed here, I'd written down here, that the Deities and Demigods book says that a cleric's alignment must be identical to his or her patron deity's alignment. Which I thought was interesting, because I remember seeing sometimes where it says worship, worshiper's alignment, and right. sometimes it just says, I thought it just says something like good or something, you know, yeah. I mean, so... But any good, any lawful, any... So yeah, then the Deities and Demigods somewhere else, I see on page 6, says that it's supposed to be identical. Right. So I don't know, I don't know what to make of that, but... Um, where would I, so where would I find, maybe you could talk a little bit about if, if so, if it is important to have a deity, particularly as a cleric, where do I find a deity? Yeah, so I think this is where um, your dungeon master, this is where the campaign now comes into focus. It's really not, I, I, you know, I want to take a deity from the Greek mythos or the Norse mythos. Well, if we're doing an Asian-themed uh, adventure or a Middle Eastern-themed adventure, theirs might not be appropriate. So your dungeon master, as part of the campaign of, or in the session zero, should be providing you the acceptable deities. I tend to, in my campaigns, create my own deities because there's a certain theme I want. Um, or, but if you buy a package product or you get one from online, the last time we played Pelinor, it had deities in Pelinor, so you would want to use them. Uh, other other uh, campaigns allow for any deity that the dungeon master allows for. Yeah, right now we're doing the Wonderlands, right, the city state from Judges Guild, and it's anything you want, right. basically. Um, so, okay, so, uh, oh, and, and I, I want to do a shout-out to the DD Roger Moore, I believe, from, in Dragon Magazine, yes. had, when he did the point of views of the different demi-humans, yeah. and he had more additional deities, and I think they're fantastic, right? right. So if you're playing, if I'm something like a half-elf, 
I'm probably going to gravitate toward an elven deity just because I think that sounds cooler. And the place I would go is to look at Roger Moore's discussion of the elven point of view. Look for not just that main deity, elven deity that you're going to find in these demigods, but look for those. Uh, I, tend to, I tend to like fringe things, so I'm going to look yeah. for maybe a little bit lesser known uh, elven rules deity. rules is written as long as it's written somewhere. Yeah. I like it. Well, it's a, but it's a deity. Right. But a deity is right. I mean, I mean, think rules is written is it's whatever the campaign permits. So as and, long as your DM says, yeah, you can pick out of this. I and think and I think go. that's a, a big DM tip, which is, we, you know, at least when I was younger, I wanted to craft everything in my, it was my campaign and I put everything to it. And then the players probably don't get as invested. Uh, they may be appreciative of all the work. But this is where you can have some flexibility and allow... Uh, them, oh, I have this great idea of the deities and, and say, oh, I was going towards this way. Maybe I take the deity and the, the kind of what the followers want to do and, and meld it into the campaign. You don't have to be so, unless it's, there's no deities, which again, you can't have that because clerics require the, the, the ability, the power of the cleric comes through the worship of the deity. And one thing, and, and I'll try to make this quick, is that what I'm learning as a DM is I need to win. So you, you, when you play a cleric, you really pay attention to, the, you know, you're Dionysus, right? the, you, you, you've got this deity and you're going to pray to the deity, you're going to do things for the deity. As a DM, I think you really need to respect that and allow that to pay dividends for the, because otherwise the cleric, if the cleric is continually praying and, right. and, and doing all those things and is getting no to the DM is just waving it off as, okay, fine, you can get your spells, I'm sure that's frustrating. So that's something I need to work on as a DM. Well, and, and, and I think we all do because it, it's, the cleric is a challenge because it's one of the only class, or it's a class here that doesn't have a, a literary archetype that you can, you can ascribe to a fighter. People have in their minds. It's Conan or you know, Ranger Strider. There's, there's some... Cleric, well, you know, the traditional characters that are a cleric, there really isn't. They're holy men or holy women that doesn't have the relationship they have. So you have to take modern figures or, or religious figures in the past and meld them in with something that has a direct conduit to the deity. So it's it's a little tougher to... to I, I like, just like you, the worshipping a deity that has not only some benefits, but also some, some challenges. So, for instance, Dionysus, because it's a Greek deity, I can't ride a horse, if I remember correctly, right? Mm, I think that's right. I, can't, I, yeah. have, I have to be in a cart based yeah. on being a Greek deity, at least per the deities and demigods. Yeah. And I think this is where the dungeon master and the players, if they're amenable, and you can move away from the tradition, you know, very... Uh, the slam that first edition and older editions get, it's all about power gaming and min-maxing and all these other things, and really focus on having some flavor. So yes, I have to remind myself and remind Dan, oh, we're going to go on horseback. I'm not going on horseback because I am a faithful servant of Dionysus and then drink a lot and, I guess and if, throw up. And the reality, if you went, I was about to say the reality, that seems a little bit strange to say in this discussion. <laughs> That's right. If, 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 you do, if you do ride a horse, then there's a good chance the next time you ask, look, I'm not, you're not going to get struck with a lightning bolt, I assume, right. but the next time you ask, you may not get all of the spells you pray for. Right, and so and okay. that's and that's the push pull too, right? The, the Greek gods are known for their, uh, you know, personalities and being very jealous. So again, if I hand wave, oh, I don't care, I'm going to ride a horse. There should be some direct results. Other deities are more aloof and uncaring because, uh, you know, they they they're either greater deities than that. So that's again a, a, an area for the player to really help flesh out the campaign. And um, also, so I'd like to do a shout out to the Judges Guild, the Unknown Gods, which is a collection of lesser gods. And these are gods that you could actually encounter. So, you know, they got like around eight, some of them have 80 hit points or so, you know, they're like a 10th level character or something. And so you could actually have campaigns where you actually have interaction with some lesser deities. Okay. So I think for my list, you have your character. I mean, you would uh, now go through the player's handbook, uh, I, I would give some guidance on what equipment, based on the starting pounder, would be allowed or not allowed. Uh, there would be some negotiation on some items that may not be in the player's handbook that, that Glade would want to possess. And again, if it was appropriate for the area they're in and the style of campaign, we would figure that out. You would write them down. You'd figure out the encumbrance. And again, that's for another, another day. And we would be ready to, to roll. What other questions are discussion do you think so you so when i'm picking a weapon because i think that's for a fighter or in the oh yeah that's always important at proficiencies right so yes. maybe you can talk a little bit about because i know that in and we're not going to be talking about unearthed arcana 
Um, well, we can talk about it, but what we, the rules will be applying is pre unearthed arcana. Uh, I know that with unearthed arcana, I think it became weapon specialization, right? Yeah. Which I'm not familiar with. I'm familiar with weapon proficiencies. Right. So, um, in first edition, the idea is, uh, for the most part, if you're good at something, you do not get a penalty. Uh, so, uh, the idea of proficiency is, uh, if you pick a weapon and you're proficient in it, you do not receive a penalty for it. If you pick up a weapon that you're not proficient in, you receive a, a, a negative a penalty to it based on the type of class. So, uh, when we're talking about weapon proficiencies, primarily, um, fighters get less of a penalty if they pick up a weapon which is not, uh, they're not proficient in. And the more, less martial classes, so for instance, thieves and uh, magic users, if they pick up weapons, they receive a greater penalty. Later editions start with, you can pick up anything, but you get bonuses depending on if you're a class. And you can use, and that bonuses get spread out to, uh, uh, to more weapons if you're a martial type uh, class. So in this case, as a ranger and a cleric, you receive a certain amount of proficiencies. And if I remember correctly, that's uh, right after the classes. And it's, uh, so there's two parts on page, let's see, page 16, I think it is. No, page 19, it says which armor and weapons are permitted. And again, because Glade is a multi-class, um, the only rule with multi-class is that there are certain characters where they must follow the restrictions of the, one of the classes. So for instance, if, if uh, Dan's character was a thief, regardless of, uh, if he was a multi-class thief, regardless of the armor uh, allowance for one class, if he's a thief, his character must wear leather armor. And that is, if I recall correctly, is that where, is that on page 32, they talk about multi-class characters? Because right. I always I also remember where that is. Yep. And this can be very confusing, right? Because there are some multi-class characters where you are restricted, like the thief, if you meant right, the thief, right. you can only wear leather armor because you need to be engaged, or at least while you're engaging in thieving skills. Okay. But then there's other multi-class characters, like a mag a fighter magic user, where you can wear armor and still cast spells. And clerics. And, cl and clerics. And so it's very confusing. You've got to actually look up the particular multi-class right. to figure out, okay, which do I have restrictions on what I can wear and what weapons? So specifically under page uh, 32, cleric combinations with fighter types may use edge weapons. So if you know if we were going through each class, uh, one of the uh, anachronisms of, of, of first edition D and D is the cleric may only use non-edge weapons or blunt weapons. They're not supposed to shed blood. Which again we think of evil deities. Why would they care about it? But that is a restriction that is in. Uh, in first edition, so rules as written, regardless of your deity, unless it, unless the DM allows based on the deity's background, uh, you must use a blunt weapon. However, because he's a half elf uh, ranger cleric, the that restriction is is waived. So, uh, so the good news is you have no limit to the type of weapon uh, based on your class. And clerics have no declare. Clerics don't have any armor restrictions. That is correct. So That's that right. would not be. So this is great. So yeah. I get to pick whatever weapons I want, whatever armor. If so many, I can pay for it. Yeah. That's on page nineteen, uh, that talks about the weapons and armor restrictions. And then on page thirty-seven, talks about the proficiencies. Uh, can we talk a little bit about spell selection? Because oh, yeah. now I'm a, I'm a cleric, and so spell selection is going to be. I'm not going to have a spell selection that I'm doing at the beginning of rolling up the character, right. unlike, say, a magic user yep. or an illusionist, right? Yeah. Well, let's pick the... Uh, yeah, basically, the, the difference is, um, and we probably need to spend uh, a, a whole podcast on spell casting, but in first edition D&D, there's basically two types of spell casters. There are spell casters who have to learn spells through books or scrolls, and they memorize them, and when they cast a spell, they have to re-memorize it, versus... Uh, clerics and druids, those who have a higher power they ascribe to, who during prayer they receive the spells, they use them and then have to repray to get them back. So as a cleric you would be praying to your deity and you'd be receiving spells based on the level uh, of, your, of your character. Which is a real advantage. So every time I can just, if I, if I know we're in a particular situation or going into a particular situation and I've rested, I can select spells as a cleric that I think would be good for what I'm about to face. That's right. Whereas the poor magic user or illusionist, 
because they just have a limited number. They, like, they have to roll for their spells, have a limited number of spells, and that's all they have. That's so right. that, can be, that can be really tough. So as a multi-class, because the initial weapons that you start with as a first-level cleric are two that you're proficient in, and as a ranger, you receive three initial weapons. But because you are multi-class, you get both of those proficiencies. Now I learned that as well. I did not realize that. That's right. So you get to pick five uh, weapons. So typically the way we would do is we would look in page 37, and it has the list of weapons, their damage, uh, their ability to injure based on the size of the target, and how much they weigh, and uh, again, based on the type of uh, character uh, Dan's trying to run, he would pick, in this case, five different weapons that he could choose. So, you know, kind of as you were thinking about this, what kind of uh, weapons were you kind of leaning toward? Well, I was leaning toward probably a, uh, I mean, there's no reason not to have a long sword over a short sword if I can afford it, right? right. Well, you, you, can, you can afford anything at this point. Yes. Right? Except so, plate mail. That's I'm the only thing you can afford. I'm thinking a long sword, and I'm certainly seeing myself having a bow, a short bow. So I was leaning toward uh, a long sword and okay. a short so, bow. So you can put down long sword and short, uh, short bow. Which you definitely have the money to do that. And yeah, and, and you said that I've got five? Five proficiencies. Wow. I mean, you know, I'm certainly going to say dagger. And this goes back to why the uh, multi-class have that level limit, because they have such advantages. There's no, there's no comparison between a first-level cleric or they're ba he's basically two characters, two first-level characters. But I'm going to move up slower. Yeah. Move up slower. So... Um, Okay, is there anything, obviously, you know, I... You could spend some more time thinking about it, but those two are kind of off. You have a, miss, you have a missile weapon, you have a, local, uh, a, a, a melee weapon, and you could pick three others. Um, you know, the, there are some advantages to certain types of weapons uh, based on the type of damage they do. This, and again, uh, there are some creatures that are more affected by um, piercing weapons. Some are receive less damage if it's a piercing or slashing weapon. So it's always good to have an edge weapon, a blunt weapon, a missile weapon, if you can, if you have the proficiency to do that. Now again, he doesn't need to be, or she doesn't need to have those proficiencies, but if she would invoke a penalty. And in, in her case, uh, Ranger gets a minus two on any weapon that they're not proficient in. Okay. Okay. And unlike other additions, you must specify the type of weapon. So saying sword, you're proficient in sword, is not sufficient. You would have to say, I'm proficient in long sword. So if you picked up a short sword, you would not be proficient in it unless you put a proficiency in that. Right, got it. So, you know, a lot of times that's for a fighter. In your case, I would probably have long sword, short sword, bastard sword, so you would have it. <laughs> so well, you that... cover your bases because uh, magic items, which is, again, a, a big component of first edition, um, because generally your, your characters, they progress, they get more spells, more hit points, but they really don't get additional features or abilities. It's really the magic items that do that. Always good to have some options. Okay. All right, is there anything else? Obviously, um, I don't know if you want to go through my purchase of equipment. We certainly can do that. Uh, I think, well, what are the jet, what are the top things that you think, uh, as a DM and as a player, that people tend to forget off their character sheet for equipment that, uh, in a first edition game, are important? That we tend to hand... A lot of... Uh, Editions in the future, other games kind of hand wave, but really is is key to being a successful first level character. Right. So certain things, of course, you have to have. So you're going to have to purchase your armor, which will usually be a big expense. You've got to purchase your weapons, of course. You know, you need to have something on your feet. I mean, yeah. at first edition really is sort of the thing where you know you're stepping on something, and the dungeon master says to you, "Well, what's your footwear?" Right. And if it's not on your equipment list, you don't have it. Right. Right. So it's it's very much like that. Um, so I'd want to have some, because I don't think armor, is armor going to come with no any footwear? So I'm going to need to buy some footwear. Well, it, it's, it's not specifically uh, described that it has footwear. And so because the list has boots, you have to assume you have to put boots on. Right. Uh, and, you know, and that's what I love about first edition is that, you know, this kind of, well, I can get high hard, high soft, low hard, low soft, is that... You may say, well, I just need footwear, but depending upon the situation, right. the DM is going to decide, okay, what's the percentage chance that you're injured, maybe based upon the footwear. That's right. So it can, it, it can make a difference. Um, and you're going to, unlike my character, which 
unfortunately, I've convinced James to allow me to have the uh, both roles on the money. You made a persuasive argument. You're 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 making some real tough choices usually. Yeah. In first edition, you're not going to have everything that you want. In terms of, and I'm just going through the equipment list on page 35 and 36. I think is it fair to say that if you're asking your DM for something that is not on the equipment list? you may have a hard time right. getting it. Right? It would be unusual that the DM would be very receptive. You say, hey, you know what I want? I want to buy this. It's not on here. It usually doesn't go over well. I, I think there's three kind of buckets I see. I see things that are not on the list because it's a, a very confined list that I have no issues with. I want to have a pouch of sand or I, you know, a staff. Is, there's, it's not listed here, a quarter staff. Yes, you go pick up a stick and, and you or take a tree limb and you make it a staff. Those are within, and I don't really adjudicate, then it's more of an encumbrance issue, how much, how many packs of sand you can carry around. And the second one is items that seem reasonable, and as long as the technology of the area supports it, like a grappling hook. There is no grappling hook, at least in first edition, on this page. You, um, or or, or, or no, I'm just going to say cantrips. Are those the spell? Caltrops. Caltrops is not listed. There's right. a reference to them in one of the, either the DMG or it's somewhere, right. but it's not on the equipment list. That's right. And so, you know, that's that's one of those you could say, yes, I in this, uh, in my campaign that is reasonable, there is a grappling hook or at least some kind of hook that you could throw up there. You know, you could argue that if you really wanted to be a stickler that, if you were going to use that, you'd have to have a proficiency in it or you would not be able to use it effectively to climb walls. Right. And then there's the third uh, group that I tend to say no to, which is borderline on advanced technology, a repeating crossbow or a, you know, a gunpowder-based gun, which is a normal item, but it's not part of the milieu unless uh, you know, the, I've, I've got some kind of cross fantasy, a higher tech thing. Um, th there's always that. Uh, or an exceptional, you know, I have a super trained w war elephant or something to that effect. I, yeah. Even though you may have the money for an elephant, is that something that you're going to have? Right. With with a sh with shotguns mounted on the side of it, you know, very high, uh, I don't even know if it's high fantasy. It's just a style of play that's not a, a son. So usually I say any kind of normal items you can have as long as you can carry it. The middle one is the things that make sense with for the milieu and then the third one is no not the gonzo kind of thing now if i recall correctly there is a reference somewhere to getting on if you have a high strength you could get i believe in addition to uh range weapon like a bow but it's a, it's a strength bow yep. but you actually have to have it custom made it costs a lot of money right and i and i believe there was a dragon magazine article talking about how to go about doing that so that's so that's something but that's Harder to get, costs a lot of money, and takes time. And I would argue a first level character would not have. I would agree completely. So in terms of livestock, you know whether I'm going to get a horse or not, or some transportation like that, really depends upon where the whole party is. Right. There's no point in buying a horse and then everyone else is on. I mean, I guess I could. I, right. I'll lead the party. Out. You guys can catch up to me. But unless everyone, I think, is going to have the transportation, it's probably a waste of money. I know that's my sense right. to buy. The, the other thing is depending on the. The armor you pick, and if you're going to be, as a ranger, you get surprise bonuses, so maybe you're heading out ahead and you walk ahead. So there's 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 different ways to adjudicate it, but typically you focus on armor first, uh, weapon, and then you hopefully pick... Uh, so food is an important uh, item that you have, which a lot of times we tend to hand wave because we're like, ah, you have food. No, in first edition, there's it's, it's hard to create food or get food, so you need to have it, and if you're out in the dungeon or in the wilderness... Um, you may not, you may starve, and there's there's issues with that. What other kind of um, items that are really synonymous with first edition play that people tend to forget sure. as far as equipment? And I want a quick note. Maybe talk about this down the road too. Is I don't really, and I remember seeing a discussion on this. I really, it's not clear to me why someone would want to buy iron rations over standard. Oh, okay. Because it's more expensive iron, but there must be a reason, right? It's they, the encumbrance. Oh, okay, got it. So iron must be less. Yeah. Right? So, so in the dungeon master's guide in the back, it has. Because one of the, def not deficiencies, one of the items, it shows the weight of weapons within the player's handbook, but the standard items, it has no weight associated in gold pieces. So you, you can't figure out the encumbrance of certain things. So you actually have to go into the Dungeon Master's Guide, and I think it's one of the back charts. And so, for instance, encumbrance of standard items, which is, uh, it's a tear-out sheet, which no one tears out, but the Dungeon Master's Guide. So rations... Iron is 75 gold piece weight. Standard is 200 gold piece weight. Perfect. 
you've answered my question. So uh, some of the items, you know, something that people don't do a lot, I think, is saving throws for items. And we had that come up the other night in the game, right? Yeah. A character fell. Right. And I pointed out, wait, you know, it's, it's what I do. Hey, I think there needs to be a saving throw. Well, what is throw. the rule? Will we'll fall. There's a rule that says when you're supposed to do a saving throw. Oh, it does on items. I thought any. Yes. I thought well. I thought it gives you the saving. So it gives you what you need to make. Does oh. it? Does it? No, does it actually. And now we're really going sideways. But yes, if you uh, if you look at the saving throws for normal items, is this where if like it helps if you have a backpack and all that? Because that's where I'm sort of heading with that. Is if is it if you have a backpack, you may want to buy a backpack. You know, the better the better um, protection you have for your items helps if you have to make saving throws. Right. For so, items. So if you have a fall, this assumes that item falls about five feet and comes into contact with a hard surface. So anything over five, a softer surface, wood like gives a plus one, a fleshy soft gives a plus five. For each, for each five foot over the first five, the items subtract one from the dice roll. Oh, so okay, so yeah, last night I think we had a ten foot drop, right. and I don't think we adjusted like that. We just did this the straight saving throw roll based upon fall. That's right. But so it, was there any talking there about? So what I, I assume does it help to have better protection? Yes. Okay. Well, you'd have to adjudicate it because you would say in this case, um, I would if you had a backpack and let's say you had a potion in the backpack. Instead of falling onto the hard surface, the you say it falls on the soft surface, so you get a bonus to that. And that's and that's very one e, right? I don't know. Again, I don't know about other editions, but a lot of it is just sort of like, <laughs> well, I I'm gonna play it this way, right? right? And so so, and again, the reason I bring this stuff up is because when you're picking your equipment, unless you've played a lot, it might not be readily apparent to you why it makes a difference. Right. You know, the equipment you're buying. So, um, you know, I'm obviously going to, yeah, I'm going to buy something to carry my stuff in, probably a backpack. Everybody, look, you got to have iron spikes, right? Because you want to spike them. And if you haven't played D&D before, you may not appreciate the importance of being able to spike doors because you may have to camp out in a room, right. rest up, um, and you don't want any baddies coming in there. And so you're definitely going to want to carry, someone needs to have some iron spikes, and that's the challenge of the, it doesn't describe the usefulness of these items. Some are self-apparent, a backpack, a sack, but some like iron spikes, why would you use it? Well, the tradition has been those iron spikes are used to spike doors so you could prevent or at least impede the progress of monsters to get into an area so you could lock yourself in and try to rest or heal yourself. And my, my thought was you can only, it depends which way the door goes. Yes. Right? So, it, you know, you, you can spike it from... Coming in. Right. right? In this so case, uh, the door here we have opens in. I would spike it so that it would not open in. Right. But if it goes out, right. you can't spike it from from outside. From going right. outside. Uh, so what I would also so the ten we should talk a little bit about the infamous That's or right. famous ten foot pole. That's right. And, and and so my recollection of the ten foot pole back in the day when we'd use it, this group that I'm playing with now doesn't tend to use a ten foot pole, but is to search for traps slowly. Right. Oh, you know, where you would tap along the floor with a 10-foot pole. Now, now, what's interesting about this is, is what I don't think people always appreciate is you're walking around a dungeon with a 10-foot pole. Right. So when you're not tapping, you still have a 10-foot pole. What's next to your pike and your giant uh, Beck de Corbin and these other uh, weapons that are meant for the outside battle that you're carrying around? Right, exactly. So if you're going to bring the 10-foot pole in to do that, bit, and look, the reality is, is that it's hard to blame player characters from bringing in the 10 foot pole and tapping because the minute they don't do that they fall in the pit trap and they die now or they have to do saving throws for all their items so i get it um so i'm going to talk to the party what i would do is talk to the party buying equipment should really be something i think that you discuss with the whole party yeah. you don't need to have five 10 foot poles people are wasting their money um, you, you got to have some I think there's a joke in there how many poles do we need to have but that's for another time so uh, yes yeah. um, a light source so a light yes. source is very important for certain characters, for certain characters of certain races. Well, let's talk about that because, so, infravision. So I'm a half elf. Yeah. So I have something called infravision. That's correct. Right. That's right. Now my and I think to sixty feet. Right? That that is my understanding. Now my my understanding is that infravision is in some respects a lot less useful than some player characters. So it's not the ability. The way I read it, it's not the ability to see in the dark. Everything, right? right? I pick up heat sources 
and I might pick up some blobs. But so it, 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 if that's true, even, as I, even if I have infravision, a light source might be quite valuable. Yeah, and, we, and, and that is, again, another challenge for the dungeon master to really play it uh, as written as opposed to sometimes we say, oh, you have infravision. The difference is if you have a class and a character, like excuse me, you have a race of a character who has improvision, they at least can somewhat fumble through a dungeon um, and not have uh, be completely blinded like humans can. Uh, you, the dungeon master has to adjudicate um, how much variability in heat sources does the character can see. So again, if the room is completely cold and pitch, it would be pitch black. Uh, but we tend to be in a normal dungeon, especially if you're being chased or chasing creatures, you would see heat sources, you would see things. Uh, monsters have the ability to actually project infravision, almost like a bat and radar, so that's why they're allowed to do it. So it is important, uh, but it's cr absolutely critical for humans to have a light source, because if not, they're completely uh, in the dark. Yeah, so, so on top, you're, you're going to want to have a light source, and what our, the party that you guys are intend to use is a bullseye lantern, yep. which seems to be very nice, right, because you can you can adjust it. That's right. It can be either a straight shot, 80 feet it's described, or it could be a 30 feet you know, standard. And what you want to remember is if you do have infravision, but you have a regular light around you, your infravision needs time to adjust. So you, right. Right, it takes like about 15 minutes. I don't know how long it takes. It right? says a few seconds to adjust, but that has to be adjudicated by the, the dungeon master. Okay. Um... So you asked, you're going to need rope. Right. You should have at least, you should have at le at least 50 feet of rope. Right. I think you should probably This is have where rope. more than one character should have rope. Agreed. One you, pole, a bunch of rope. We don't need to go into it, but there's a good chance you'll need rope. Yeah. You're going to want to tie, either tie somebody up or tie somebody to somebody else, or exactly. you're going to need rope. Uh, an item that I really like, that I always pick, and I don't see a lot of people pick, is a small mirror. Yes. I love the small mirror. I like to use a small mirror to, you know, the DMs oftentimes, it depends on your DM. Right. But, you know, I've had situations where I've actually been able to slide a mirror a little bit underneath a door because right. there's a space and get a little sense of what's in there around corners. So I love the mirror. I always pick a mirror, a small mirror, obviously not a large mirror. Um, I'm going to need a holy symbol. And I think that this discussion has come up um, on places like Dragon's Foot. Where why why do I want a I an iron holy symbol which is two gold pieces right and then you've got the silver holy symbol which is fifty gold pieces and then you got the wooden one which is seven silver pieces wouldn't I just want the wooden certainly as opposed to to the silver though you may talk about it's maybe it's an undead thing but if I just need a a useful holy symbol because I'm a cleric right. so I have to check on the box I need a holy symbol because I need the holy symbol to turn right. Or do some of your rit some of your spells and rituals. Sure. Why don't I? I'm just going to buy the wooden. Right. Right. Is there any? Can you think of any real advantage to getting the more expensive whole? Unless the DM is going to do something. Special. There is no mechanical reason why you would get the difference that that I'm aware of. It would typically was a, a thing of status. And again, if you're really playing your character, as you would want the best presentation for your deity. But there is no there is there is no mechanical benefit. Um, from a wood to a iron to a silver. Well, you know, in, in this case. Well, you know, we were just talking about saving throws for items. Right. So if it's wooden, right. Maybe I want more protection because if I lose my holy symbol, if it's wooden, I don't know. Well, easier to break. It depends on which uh, saving throw you have to make because again, each one is dependent. That's on absolutely it. true. So, so fire, maybe iron would be better than uh, wood, but uh, but silver, you could say, could be soft jewelry. So that you know, really, there has to be that discussion about. If that. I drop it in a pool, I want wood. Right. Exactly. exactly. Right. So it doesn't sink. That I think is. Those those are the things that I would be looking. To buy. Okay. Those are things I'd be looking. Uh, to buy. I'd, I'd probably have a torch too just in case my lantern smashes like it did the other night. Well, and if you're going to have a lantern you need to have something with it. And oil. And you yeah. need something to... A tinder box. That's right. Yeah, so you got to buy all that stuff. So, and that really is where uh, if you're a new player and you have a new DM this is the opportunity to continue to grow and that has a style of play which is embraced in the first edition which is you have to have these items, you have to have all the items and it depends on the dungeon master, you know, uh, there's a rule about, for instance, experience points, which we'll talk about in another podcast. You have to 
take this all the treasure out of the dungeon into some safe place. Well, that means you need sacks. If you have no way to carry, if you find a, a treasure, a pile of gold, how are you getting it out of there if you don't have sacks or you don't have a backpack? And if you, so those are the, some of the challenges that um, it's almost like preparing for a camping trip. If you, some people just kind of show up, they're the ones who don't do as well. Right. All right. Well, I think that's a, a good place to stop here for creating a character. We've gone through the ways of rolling a character, how to pick a, change the attributes, pick a class, pick a race, the benefits of that, how to pick a, the hit points, proficiencies, talk about some of the, the, the philosophy of first edition. Um, how long do you yeah, think no. Glade Leaf is going to last? Well, I think one of the next ones we should run uh, Glade through uh, a, a, a basically a gauntlet of, of creatures and see how long they last. Maybe it's a thing of goblins or orcs. Maybe we'll start with kobolds, how many kobolds Glade would go through. And again, as a ranger, there's some benefit yeah. to that. And then go maybe goblins and we'll, we'll actually go through first edition combat because that's probably one of the areas that gets a lot of questions. You know, you and I have gone back and forth on how... Uh, combat should work, so that would be a good podcast to have Glades go through uh, some combat and then maybe do a mini adventure to kind of sh see how first edition is is played. Now, that Glade likes that. Glade Glade wants to kill lots of humanoids. Right, and Glade's very excited. Uh, and probably that's what she was painting. She was painting scenes of her killing lots of human lives. And now everyone you know, saw those, and they were like, "You know what? <laughs> Perhaps you should do Perhaps, this." Perhaps yes. This is. <laughs> yes, you should so, kill. I mean, I appreciate the mural on the side of right. the barn of you right. know the hobgoblin being exactly. decapitated, but you right. know, yeah. it's, it's a little disturbing. It's a little disturbing. Impressive, but yeah, disturbing. We should get it out there. Yeah, so, it uh, was a win-win for the whole community. So we we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, grogcast here, and and uh, you can check us out on, on grogcon.com where we're starting to plan the, uh, the end-of-year event called GrogCon, which will be part of the Crucible 8 convention. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, so please see you there. We're also on uh, Meetup and other social media. So on behalf of Dan, this is James signing off. All right, this is Dan signing off. All right.